Anyway, so this is, uh, this is one of the more important physiology concepts. And have you guys studied Frank Starling Law before? Yeah, do you guys want to review or do you guys know it really well? Let's review, okay, so um, three things we're gonna talk about before I go into Frank Starling is the definitions, three definitions that are really important to understand. Preload, afterload, and contractility. Are those words that you've heard before? No, okay, so preload is what, ha what is present or what, I guess, is the load before the actual work happens. Afterload is what the work is happening against. So think of this in terms of the heart, right? And this is the left ventricle, and this is the aorta coming out of it. The work that's about to happen is that the blood is going to go from the left ventricle to the aorta when it, when it contracts, right? The amount of blood that's sitting in there at the end of diastole, what is diastole? End of filling time, right? So the heart will fill with blood. The end diastolic volume of the left ventricle, right, which is the amount of blood that's present in the left heart just before it contracts is your preload. Does that make sense? End diastolic volume, because diastolic is the relaxation filling time of the left heart and the right heart, right? So left ventricular end diastolic volume would be the preload for the work that's about to happen to pump the blood into the aorta. All the resistance that's in the systemic circulation, because the aorta pumps into the systemic side, right, not the lung side. All the resistance in the systemic circulation is technically, the afterload definition technically is a little bit more complex, but for practical purposes, it's equal to this systemic resistance. For a basic physiology class, this definition is pretty good. Technically, it's not 100% not accurate, the resistance, because there's some other factors like, you know how like capacitors have impedances and stuff? So technically, you're supposed to compute an impedance of the circulation, which we won't do. So we'll call it systemic resistance, and we'll call that afterload, okay? So that is what you're pumping against. So we already mentioned stiff arteries have higher resistance, which means the afterload that the, that the heart faces in stiff circulation is higher, right? And then the intrinsic vigor of the heart is what I would say. It's like the best way to describe it. Intrinsic vigor of the heart is going to be contractility. This is also known as the inotropic state. So this is how forceful our contractions are when they happen, right? And contractility is not dependent in healthy hearts about on the uh, preload and the afterload. Or I guess, yeah, it's, it's just an intrinsic property of the heart. So a good heart, like an athlete's really, really healthy heart, has a higher contractility than an old man who's sick with heart disease heart. That heart has poor vigor, and the athlete has good vigor. So higher contractility and healthy disease states, poor contractility, right? So Frank Stalling relationship is an interesting relationship which basically just, you know, tells us everything about cardiac physiology. When you have more blood fill in the heart, what happens at the muscular level is that there are these sarcomeres that we studied about in the MSK lecture, right? All muscle is kind of with sarcomeres, even smooth muscle. And so the sarcomeres lengthen because the heart needs to get bigger to hold more blood. As the sarcomeres lengthen, when they're going to contract, they're going to generate a more forceful contraction, right, in healthy hearts. So it's going to pump out more of that blood. So the more the blood comes in, in your diastole, the more will be pumped out. And that is what the Frank Starling relationship is. So let's assume the second line, second colored line, or let's say the green line is normal, what they're saying. This is a normal function. So it means as you increase the end diastolic volume from point A to point B, the amount of blood that the heart pumps out in one beat, which is a stroke volume, goes up, right? Because point A, it pumps out this much, and point B, it pumps out this much. So it pumps out this much extra stroke volume. This is kind of what happens when you exercise. When you exercise, I mean, this is a very basic boiling down of exercise. Exercise physiology is super interesting. I mean, we won't go into it, but if you're running, your, your veins are pushing in more blood up because you're contracting your calves and all these muscles, and you're getting more blood to the heart. We already know that we use have cardiac output increases a tremendous amount during exercise. Two reasons for that. What is cardiac output dependent upon? Does your heart rate go up during exercise? Yes. Does your stroke volume go up during exercise? Why? 
Yeah, because veins push in more blood into the heart, you have more end diastolic volume, you have more stroke volume. That's the mechanism of why you increase your stroke volume. Yesterday. So this Frank Stalling law is like the classic thing that happens. Now, increasing the blood in the heart is not always a good thing. In cases of patients with poor systolic function, which we'll later learn is like patients with heart failure, which is basically the end result of all heart diseases, heart failure, they don't have the ability to actually pump. Their contractility is low, right? We decide the vigor is not there. So in those cases, it doesn't increase the stroke volume that much. And blood just starts to pool and pool and pool because you're increasing the blood in the heart, but the muscle can't, it's, not, it's weak. It can't pump that much blood out. So it's just getting poorer and poorer and poorer. So this indicates good contractility or normal contractility. If I were to draw a graph of one of you healthy people exercising, it'd be even higher, right? Because that heart has, is pumping out more than the volume increases. And then in this case, it's like a diseased heart, which doesn't have enough contractility, and it's just not increasing the stroke volume. Because here, the end diastolic volume is the same in this heart and in this heart. But this heart is pumping almost half as much as this one does, because this is not healthy and this is healthy. So that is basically the Frank Stalling relationship. I highly encourage that you guys understand this super well. Yeah. I think it's, it's because with good exercise, your contractility probably goes up, which is what reduces your heart rate. So at resting time, you don't need as much heart rate anymore because your heart's so efficient at pumping that it, it, it pumps at a lower rate to meet your cardiac output needs. So it's, it, it doesn't mean that anything's bad. It's just good. Your heart's functioning more efficiently. Um, not to say that those of us who don't have heart rates in the 50s while resting are doing any bad. We're doing fine. You know. Um, so this is basically PV loops. A large part of your homework is going to be on PV loops. I feel like if you don't understand fully, it's like fine, but you will understand by the end of your problem set how to work with PV loops. So the end systolic pressure volume relationship. So one thing that we can do really quickly is label some stuff on the PV loop, right? And PV loops are drawn for each ventricle chamber independently. So this is your left ventricular pressures, and this is your left ventricular volume, right? And what happens is you, your heart fills in, fills in, fills in during diastole. This is your end diastolic volume. Then the heart transiently contracts while the aortic valve is shut. It's not open yet. Because remember, there's a small gap between the isovolumic contraction phase. Goes up, right? So the volume doesn't change because the aortic valve is closed, but the heart's contracting with force. But the pressure goes up because the heart's contracting, the valve is shut. So it's generating like this force. So that's that. And then the aortic valve opens, whoosh. And then it like comes down and then it's losing its volume, but it, because of the contraction force, it's gaining pressure, systolic pressure. So this is end systolic pressure, and this is end systolic volume, right? So your stroke volume is what? Because end diastolic was this much, and you pumped out that much during contraction, so you got left with this much. Then your heart starts relaxing and fills up again with this. Right, so end systolic volume, end diastolic volume, end systolic pressure, stroke volume. And then this relationship, the slope of this line represents contractility of the left heart. Pardon me? Yeah, it should be linear. My diagram is not neat. It's usually, you could just draw a linear line. So that represents contractility. And that's basically telling you how much, in, in rough sense, what is the slope of this line? In rough sense, the slope of this line is some delta p over some um, volume, right? So if your heart has, is working to pump out a large volume with a, with a decent enough pressure, it's high contractility. Whereas if your heart is pumping a decent amount of volume, or, or small volume with the same change of pressure, then it's low contractility. Because it'll go up and down, basically. It's pressure over volume. I won't call it delta P or delta V because that's compliance. But you get the idea. It's like P on this side and V on the x-axis. So don't write delta P over delta V. That's technically not correct. So, 
So with increasing contractility, the force generation increases, right? And it's not dependent upon loading conditions, because preload is end diastolic volume, and that's far end on this side of PV loops, right? So that doesn't really change your end, end systolic pressure volume relationship. It's like the intrinsic quality of the heart that determines what the end systolic pressure is. And then you connect it to the end systolic pressure to get your linear line. So in cases of preload, we already discussed when the heart fills in, this is all assuming normal hearts. If the preload increases, we already concluded stroke volume goes up from Frank Stalling law. So you can see that the PV loops get fatter and fatter as the end, end diastolic volume increases. Can you see that change? That's it. That's all that's changing. If you change the afterload, which means the heart has a higher resistance to work against, and it's pumping the same amount of blood, because contractility is the same, notice that all those PV loops on the afterloop curve have the same slope, right? So the contractility is the same. The cardiac output is the same. The heart muscle is healthy. And you've transiently increased the afterload, let's say by squeezing my hand grip like this, because I'm you know, squeezing it. My muscles are compressing on my arteries, and my resistance is going up. So if I do this, my afterload is increasing. But I'm standing here, my heart hasn't changed functioning, my cardiac output's the same, my um, heart contractility is the same. So what's going to change if my resistance increases? Pressure, and systolic pressure, which is why the loops get higher and higher. And to meet that pressure, I'm going to pump out slightly less volume. My PV loops get thinner and thinner. So pressure goes high because I'm applying this resistance by, by like gripping my hands really, really tight or by squatting down, in which case my legs will increase the resistance. And then my loop becomes thinner and thinner. If I change my contractility altogether, which means one heart and two heart, second heart, and I increase this contractility, right? Then for the same end diastolic volume, I'll get a bigger stroke volume. An example of that will be this. It's kind of hard to see. Dotted line and black line, right? Dotted line has higher contractility than the black line. End diastolic volume is 80 cc's in both. Can anyone, everyone see that? OK, so in the heart with low contractility, my curve is this, is my end systolic one. So this, this is my stroke volume in the black line heart, OK? X amount, which would be about 40. In, in the dotted line, the same dotted line heart from here, my stroke volume is this much, which is longer, larger than the previous one, right? And so in a higher contractility for the same amount of preload, I'm going to pump out more blood because my heart has intrinsically more strength. And my PV loop will widen. And because the contractility is the one that's different, not the resistance or anything, my slope of ESP or PVR changes. And this is kind of complex cardiac physiology. It took me, you know, I've, I studied this first in 2006, and it's 2014. So it's taken me like eight years to develop like kind of an in-depth understanding to the point I can teach it. So it takes a while to get it. But it's super important, and the homework set is like a decent percentage focus on this with the simulations that you will learn it really well, and we'll help you in office hours. So if you don't understand everything right away, it's OK. We'll, we'll work on it. But you have to understand this much. This is basic physiology. So this is just an example of mitral stenosis. We'll talk about stenosis at the end briefly. But stenosis means the, the valve is thickened, and it's not opening as well. So mitral valve helps. Move the blood from where to where. You guys just have to say it out loud. Mitral valve, left atrium to left ventricle. So if mitral valve is not opening as much, what is happening to your preload? Going down, good. That's what it shows. The yellow curve shows the preload going down, stroke volume goes down. Frank Starling, very basic, right? Next one, aortic stenosis. Now aorta is pumping blood outside from left ventricle to the body, correct? So if my left ventricle if my left ventricle is having a harder time pumping that blood because this valve is really thick or diseased in stenotic state, what happens to my afterload? Increase, because it's harder to pump that blood out from that valve, not easier, because it's stenotic, not regurgitant, which would be different. So in stenotic, we already talked about when the afterload increases, your PV loop thins and it rises. So it's kind of quite elementary. Like you use the same three concepts, preload, afterload, contractility, and understand them as independent variables, and then you get this kind of relation. 